we promised that we would update you on the Allegro Sleeper project every month. So that is what we're doing. This is part five of the Allegro Sleeper project. I'm Johnny Smith. Welcome to the Late Break Show. I'm carrying a chair. <laughs> In this episode, you will see us fitting up a pedal box, which is why I've brought the chair. We're not putting the interior in today. Him doing some extreme CAD for radiator location, alternator relocation, and some strut top chat. It might not look like a great deal has happened since the last episode, but a lot has. Over to you, Adam. Yeah, so we're now at a point where we basically have full running gear on the front end because we've got strut towers and yeah. the rear half of what is the inner wings. So we're now at a point where the, the struts are mounted, we've got lower arms. The only thing we're missing from the actual running gear is a roll bar, really, and the car could go back on the floor. Yep. The only reason we haven't done that is because we haven't sorted out the rear suspension yet. So we're going to leave it on the jig while, bef yeah, before we, while we decide what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. Yeah. And then, of course, we're now at a point where we've also got the front panel in the correct position, roughly. Roughly. So that the wings basically just bolt on and off now. So this is a really good position to be at to then start thinking about things like the radiator and all of the engine ax ancillaries and just begin to kind of make a car with all the parts we need to run it. If you are watching this and you didn't watch the previous episode, episode four, uh, this might not make any sense, so watch that first. But one of the things that, that we left off on was we have to take some of the ancillaries off the front of the K-series in order to um, relief some space for a rad um, and also to be able to play around with a different inlet manifold. So you can see the inlet manifold is no longer on the car, and there are some shiny new parts to the K20, and they are from T7 Design. We'll show you those a bit closer. But, um, but basically, the alternator is now relocated. There's a kit from T7 Design, British company, made in Britain, uh, that takes the, from up here down to there, which is really crucial for us. And the inlet manifold, the original one, is quite bulbous. Yeah. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. It came out like a big ram's horn. Yeah, so we did mention the alternator relocate last time that we would need that, not only to clean up the engine bay, but again, we need to get that, that, all those kinds of ancillaries lower down so that we've got more space to have an inlet manifold that's going to work well with the turbo setup rather than being a kind of naturally aspirated type. Yeah, bigger in intake. The idea is also, like Adam was saying before, the bonnet's going to stay as a conventional hinged bonnet with the hinges here and, you know maybe gas struts and who knows, but the front panel will be attached to the wings and will be either hinged or quick release as, as one. So two wings, front panel off. Um, and as we've discovered before, we're trying to keep as much of the original paint in the car as possible, which is a headache, frankly. Definitely, <laughs> especially given that some of the car already needs to be painted because this doesn't have any paint on it. Yes, um, yeah, we'll have to blend the, the new with the old or newer yeah. with the old. As long as some of the original paint stays, you know, then I guess that's... Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the majority of the car, really. It's just the kind of very front and very back. It is, it is the very front. This is great though. Yeah, it's so nice to see this I still haven't shape. figured out exactly what we're going to do with the kind of front half of the inner wing or if we're going to do one at all. Because normally you would have the inner wing attached to the front panel and or wings because it's all part of the, the structure. That's yeah. why this front panel is much heavier than the wings are yeah. because this is actually part of the structural Allegro, really. Yeah. We don't need this for structure anymore because we're using the chassis rails and kind of doing things in a different way. Yeah. So if we fabricate inner wings... They're just going to get in the way and not allow you to have the full benefit of removable front. Yeah. Because the idea is 
kind of with the removable front, a bit like on a, an R53 Mini, where when you take the bonnet up, yeah. the bonnet, wings, and almost the front panel all go together. It leaves you with just having basically all of the front of the car exposed. And if you start to add in inner wings, you're not really covering it up as such, but no. they end up flapping around and not really having anything to mount to. And again, like that setup works quite well. So kind of get inspired by that and, and probably just leave it wingless. So really, when it comes to the strut top side of things, um, the beauty of having the jig set up was that that would fix the camber angle and the caster of where that strut top was. So I kind of aimed for a, a kind of rough five degrees lean back on the strut top, used the jig to fix the hub, and that gives me the exact strut top position, which should hopefully be symmetrical on both sides, depending on how symmetrical I built the car up to this point. And then it's just a case of, building steel work around it. So started out with the actual tower assembly, which I cut some out of, you know, just to relieve weight that we don't need, shows off the spring. Um, and then, yeah, kind of building an inner wing section, which this is where all the strength comes from because we're tying it all back into the bulkhead. We'll obviously need a, a strut brace taking us towards the other side of the car. And again, back to probably the middle of the bulkhead-ish, but that more or less is complete, depending on what we do with the front half of the inner wing. Engine mounts. Yes, so we've now got the Vibrotechnics engine mounts. I mean, these are an attractive engine mount. Yeah, they're, they're, I'm they're not gonna lie. Yeah, they're really good. The Vibrotechnics stuff is always nice to look at. Look at these bad boys. So these, you, you made me order these. Yeah, these so- These will go- In between here. That so, way up? Yeah, yes. so originally I made a, like a dummy mount. Yeah. So there was no flex in it. And now that we've, I've got all these welded up, obviously we still need to tidy and make pretty and do some drillium. Yeah. But that replaces that essentially. That will sit in there. Yeah, and then the same on the other side. You, you can kind of see better on the other side. And then there will be an engine mount at the back or the front? At both. Both. So yeah, that you, again, we're just gonna mount it more or less as is in the Civic. So the Civic has a torque mount front and back. It also has one um, that goes to the inner wing. I'm not sure we'll need it, um, but I think that might be a bit towel. belt and braces, but we'll see. Or two sets of braces. Yeah, because we're still going to have a, a big strut brace on the top of those strut towers as well yet. So yeah. again, we can, you know, we, we've still got a bit of freedom to do what we like in terms of making it functional and look pretty. So Adam did take the engine out again in order to um, remove some of those parts or what, what was the main reason for taking it out again? Finish off welding on the inner wings, um, you know, just it, it's, it's much easier to, when, especially when the car's on the jig, to get in there with the engine in. I'm more or less like sat on top of the engine welding. I do have some footage of that, I think. Um, and then it's just, easy. I mean, it, we're at a point where it's so easy to get it in and out, you may as well take it out because it's just on two bolts. So we yeah. whip the engine out, you can work a lot easier, finish some welds off, clean some bits up. Yeah put it back in again. I also needed to weld up the engine mount, so. So the water pump delete panel here, it's not a panel, was it an adapter? Plate. Plate. Yeah, plate. Um, which, like Adam said, relocates the alternator lower. This is what was on the car. So that's the water pump, right, in that casting? Yep, so water comes out of the block into here, sucked out via this pulley. Yeah and then uh, gets pushed out of here into the thermostat, essentially. So it's a big casting. That's now been removed, which I guess from a cleanliness point of view is cleaner, but it's also, it, it alleviates that amount of space. And does that mean we don't need? Yeah, so we don't need this. The alternator normally sits in here. In this, in I wouldn't be able to hold it if I put the alternator in here as well, because it's so heavy. You're very strong though. I am pretty strong, yeah. Yeah. I don't mind admitting it. 
<laughs> Do you need to say it under your voice? The microphone still picks it up. <laughs> I'll say it quietly and then yeah. I won't look so... Exactly. <laughs> and I don't mind telling you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the alternator normally sits in here. And then, of course, that's the full auxiliary belt system. Yeah. So we're getting rid of this tensioner setup, yeah. this pulley, the water pump pulley, and the alternator. Move the alternator lower down. And then, all, and then basically... the the crank pulley only drives the alternator now, and then there's a tensioner, which I haven't got fitted yet on the side of this T7 plate. Like I say, from an aesthetic perspective, it's way better. There are pros and cons to running an electric water pump because you know, you've got to control it and it's just something else to do. Yeah. Um, but we needed to move the alternator anyway, and the other option was just keep the water pump and move the alternator down, but then it would have been kind of in view below the the valance and um, right, so there that are, would have been that, that, that yeah. was an option. So that was like really what drove to go for the water pump delete, and it's because without the water pump, you can basically mount the alternator where the water pump was, yeah, which keeps it higher up and not in view. Then basically, yeah. Now a lot of people uh, in the previous episode were concerned about the depth um, of the engine, sort of how low the sump was on the K20 on this build. Adam did point out to me, and I thought, instead of writing a reply to every comment on YouTube, which got a bit boring after about <laughs> 25 of them, um, you were saying you've measured the sort of current intended ground clearance. Of the yeah. Car. You said that's going to be about five inches. Yeah, so we've got about five inches to the sump from the floor. Um, and, of course, the sump is a little bit further forward of the like, drive line. So, yeah, if you was to come up against a big speed bump, yeah, you might hit it because the wheels aren't going to hit the speed bump first. Yeah, but I don't know any speed bumps that are like five inches high. So well, we're also going to put some protection on it. I'm not going to leave it raw. Yeah, yeah, we're going to have the the sports valance. Sports valance. No, it'll have some sort of <laughs> it'll have some sort of guard. Yeah, yeah, we can do like a little you know just, just a some, little skid some guard sort of or something. Yeah, yeah, we could even do maybe some some sort of titanium. Titanium rally style, so you can have the skids, the skid sparks. So you just skip, yeah. <laughs> we, won't, we won't be doing that, but, no, we, but rest assured, it will be protected in some way, yeah. And dry sumping is something you can always do later down the lines. Well, you don't need to do that right now because there's no other than a little bit of pipe work in the engine bay, there's yeah. nothing that stops you doing that later down the line. It doesn't change the engineering here, yeah. Let's just get the thing running first. It's been so long, yeah. Let's just try and get the car moved on and. If we decide, actually, okay, maybe with suspension travel and a really big bump in the road, maybe we'd prefer to have no sump. Yeah. So the front panel is 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 on here. Um, Adam's kind of prototyped this bolt. Or I guess you call it a crash bar. Of some yeah, sort of kind of. Yeah, that's what it's inspired by. Um, so this is, you can see, this is tacked on to a bar, which is then bolted to this. But... Although we know this is at exactly the right height for the car, as in the wings and everything to be in line with the car, this doesn't have to bolt onto there. This could come out up or down, so this particular baton could mount higher up or lower down. And I say that because that there, remember, this aperture, which used to be just a sort of a louvered blanking panel or a fog light on a high-ranking Allegro, we can cut that out and use that as real forced air feed to something like the turbo which is going to live here. So just bear that in mind. And this is not finished. This is still in the mock-up phase. So we thought we'd just stick this back on um, loosely to illustrate how bulbous mm -hmm. the inlet manifold is for the, uh, for the FN2, or the UK spec FN2, yeah. as you were saying. It comes out a long way. It protrudes. And although it's a great inlet manifold, for us... A, with turbocharging, and B, with clearance issues, it's not going to work for this particular application so well. Right, rad time. You just saw Adam playing with cardboard on the floor. There was a reason for that, prototyping. So with the relocated alternator 
uh, the electric uh, water pump kind of uh, adapter plate, so no big water pump that we showed you before. We've got this area to play with on the Allegro, and we do want to actually use the radiator grill as the radiator as much as possible. Yep. So what's your theory here? Just to try and get as much surface area as possible. The beauty of the Allegro is that a lot of the front panel is actually exposed. It's, it's mainly just all whole. Yeah. So it's very whole. Yeah, we can, we can use that to our advantage and have a fairly big radiator in here. Yeah. Possibly quite a thick one. Yeah. Um, and full height that we can get in, in between basically that crash bar and where the, basically the bonnet would sit. Um, and that gives more or less the same amount of area as what you would get on the stock road car Honda Civic. So that, yeah, ideally we want to get as much surface area as possible. That's the plan. Just get something as big as possible in there and then a, a small intercooler behind it, basically. Uh, so the intercooler would live directly behind? Yeah, I think or? so. Yeah. Again, we might not need, we don't might not need much of an intercooler because the enemy of like an intercooler is a boost pressure. Yeah, the more boost pressure we're going to run, the hotter things generally are. So if we're not we're going to run a lot of boost pressure because we don't need a lot of power, a small intercooler is fine. Right, okay, okay. And then electric fan or fans? Yeah, I think electric fans, again, you can't have too many because it's one of those things that they're not very big. If we can fit a couple of small ones on there, yeah. that'll be fine for idling and in traffic and stuff like that. It, you know, you're never going to overcool it really. Yeah. How does she feel? Brilliant. It's always exciting to sit in an Allegro because <laughs> I'm that kind of <laughs> twisted person that thinks that. And this is the first time the reupholstered seats have been in the car, so although the, it's just a trial fitment, it's still good to see them in there. Looks cool. Yeah, it is. But we're in here to just offer up the pedal box because we're going for an adjustable um, aftermarket pedal box. So you're probably watching it and going, why are you going for an original interior? Well, obviously that whole ethos of a sleeper is such that you don't want to give the game away too much. And actually you could say that this is, the, is going to be the shiniest part of the car that's not under the bonnet or underneath the chassis. And as, actually, as I was looking at this pedal box this morning, I did have a moment of feeling guilty and thinking, have we gone over the top here? Does this have to be painted brown? I think a brown anodise on the pedals would be a good, good do, choice. Does anybody brown anodise? Yeah. They must do, mustn't yeah, they? Yeah, you, you well, anodising is like an electrical process, I think, so you can kind of do it... Um, However. Yeah, more or less any colour. I went for a pendulum, you know, top mount rather than a bottom mount. The main reason why I went for that is because I think the shape of the floor pan in this is it's a little bit tight. And there's that cut in for the uh, wheel arch yeah. on the right. And I didn't want the throttle to be way over. We haven't taken the original pedal box out. No, yeah, I think the first step really is to figure out how far out or, you know, what in what, in, in terms of comfort level, mm -hmm. how good is the pedal placement where it is because then we or can indeed. aim to try and get this pedal box in roughly the same or slightly different position yeah well if you look at the center line of the steering wheel is on the center line of my crotch right which means the pedals are in line with the it's not like a weird italian car where it's all yeah or a defender the, or a defender so the <laughs> so the clutch sorry the brake the center pedal is Right, right on the centre boss of the steering wheel, actually. And I like, I do like a bit of healing and towing. Well, that will allow that adjust. Yeah, we can, we can move the pedals closer together or further apart. Yeah, and there's adjustability. Space. And I've got big feet. I mean, I'm wearing steel-toed shoes, so they look even bigger. Luckily, these pedals are quite long. Let me just grab a tape. Ten. 
but those are quite long pedals They've compared got, to those pedals. They're really long. Being tall, I'd want the, the, the pedal box to be as far yeah. up. Yeah, in that to... case, we'll probably end up having to um, move the where the column mounts and the uh, steering rack comes through. You can see the dash has been repaired because it was heavily cracked, which is a common problem on our grows. So uh, MPR have started smoothing out the dash, but they haven't painted it because I want to get it flocked. I'm going to get it flocked in Motorsport Brown, which is a colour that doesn't exist, but basically going to get it matched to this and the centre console um, here, but flocked. I don't know if I'll get this bit flocked or not, but no. Uh, and we're going to repurpose some of the gauges for more modern purposes. But that's good because you now can work with the dash being in place so you know where some of the parts go. Yeah, I had no idea how big or how little the dashboard was, so I didn't know <laughs> what kind of reinforcements I can put behind here. Because yeah. like I've mentioned to you previously, I want to take the chassis leg portion up yeah. towards the the A pillar yeah. uh, and the door shut to try and you know, triangulate that strength, yeah. my favourite word, and bring it, just bring it all together, bring that, all that structure we put in at the front, then into the rest Racing of the car body. So we're not putting, the, you're not putting the all interior back together yet, a little while before that happens, but um, still, tactical progress. A little tease. This is a T7, the same company who um, we've got that relocation plate for, for the alternator and a couple of other parts that are coming for the, the K20 engine. They do a lot of K20 innovative solutions. They also do these really compact little heater boxes because a lot of people that build hot K20 uh, converted cars need this sort of thing. So we're thinking we can put that in, in there somewhere. Well, it's certainly smaller than the original Smith's box. Oh yeah, definitely. There's no doubt. And it'll that. be way more efficient. And it'll be way more efficient, <laughs> which is one of the reasons for, for going for it. Shafts. That's what we're going to talk about briefly. We're not going to do any welding of shafts in this episode, but I wanted to talk about it because obviously the car is now Honda engined. I've managed to get some Honda drive shafts here in very good condition. In fact, they're pretty much unused. But like Adam said, we're going to have to hybrid almost a shaft setup. So we've got to take a pair of Honda shafts and marry them with a pair of, in this case, Golf GTI Mark II uh, drive shafts. These are second hand. Big shout out to a chap, a friend of mine, a uh, motoring journalist called JJ Vollens, who has his own YouTube channel, which I'll put below, because he said, oh, I've got a pair of these in the shed. If you're going to chop them up and prototype them, you're welcome to them. Thanks, JJ. Big thanks. So, Adam, I'm right in thinking you're going to use the outer yep. of the Golf GTI because of the VW hub. Yep. So, well, basically, what we need to do is just chop both shafts in half yeah. and weld them together just to make a prototype shaft yeah. that's the correct length because there is actually a really specific length because the drive shaft goes in and out of the pop joint as the suspension goes up and down and articulates. Yeah. So you've got to get that length right or you'll always have problems with... Overextension. Yeah, or popping compression. drive shafts out and things yeah. like that. Yeah. So we need to basically make a prototype set and... Plenty of people do just run welded drive shafts and you can do it, but given that the lengths we're going to, to try and make a well-engineered car, it's better just to get a set made, mm. a, a proper set from some good quality steel, machined on both ends, and then you'll end up with a pair of reliable drive shafts that you'll most likely get a lifetime guarantee with. So we're gonna use that end, which bolts into the gearbox, Yep. But we're not going to use that end of the Honda. No, we won't need the Honda outer CVs. We use that end. Of yeah, we use the Volkswagen outer CVs and yeah. the Honda inners, and that'll make our uh, Honda wagon shaft. You'll see that on the next on the next episode, or maybe the episode after. But obviously, if you haven't watched previous episodes, look at those. And if you want to look at this build in more minute detail than I do on the Late Break Show, watch his channel, Fabco. I'll put it under the screen now.
I hope you've enjoyed these uh, project updates. We are promising to update you on a more regular basis, which is what we've been doing. Still plenty more to do at the front, but in the next episode, there's a chance we'll be doing some more on the rear suspension. I say we, it'll be him in there, Adam. So thanks very much for watching. Subscribe if you haven't. Maybe you can become a Patreon if you want to support us that way. You'll get earlier access to these videos, but also you'll get minute detail on the build of the Allegro if you support his YouTube channel, Fabco. To do it, I dare you. Cheers.